is on racing equipment and safety. And the panel members are Mr. Robert Colton, who's president of the Delaware Park Jockeys Association, Bob Duncan, a consultant with uh, great experience and status in starting gate issues, Dr. Edward Hall, who's the director of spinal cord and brain injury research at the, who's the director of the spinal cord and brain injury research center at the University of Kentucky, Jeff Johnston, who's the regional manager of the Jockeys Guild, Nick Nicholson, of course, is president of Keeneland and CEO, and Mike Ziegler, who you heard this morning, executive director of the NTRA Safety and Integrity Alliance. And now to introduce uh, some some presentations and then conduct the uh, the question session is uh, we bring back to the stage uh, Dr. Mick Peterson. Thanks, Head. Um, we're going to start out this afternoon with a couple short presentations, but I'm going to take the liberty of uh, telling you a little background on uh, on on when I got first got involved in uh, racing surfaces. I was actually coming from the imaging side of the of, of world. I was an engineer working with uh, with uh, bone imaging techniques, and at that point we were looking at uh, doing a study on a small training track at Colorado State. I was on the faculty there, and at that time I asked a very naive question. I said, "If we're going to be able to reproduce this study, what are the standards that our little training track has to satisfy in order to be able to reproduce this study later on in, as a part of the academic literature?" Well, I was in a room with five veterinarians and essentially got five blank stares at that point. There's a number of other areas in the racing arena where we've got sort of the same situation, and it doesn't matter whether it's starting gates or surfaces. And this panel today is going to discuss some of the progress we've made on that and some of the room that we have to, uh, to, to improve. The first person who's going to give a short presentation is Nick Nicholson, who's going to give a little broader sense of this and also put some of the information from the morning into context. Nick. Now this thing's got me nervous. The white one, the white one, the white one. The right one, the right one. Uh, making racing safer. We, this is uh, uh, such a simple statement and it, 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 there, there's no bottom to it. Uh, the, in preparing this presentation though, I think in perspective, one thing that we should look on is that there is an inherent danger to our sport, and we should not deny that. We're trying to help mitigate that, but there's an inherent danger. But we shouldn't deny that to our race fans either. We're not the only sport that has an inherent danger attached to it. Car racing, football, just to mention two off the top of your head. Danger is part of those athletic competitions. Those sports have been able to maintain their bond and their credibility uh, with their patrons and fans and supporters because they have earned or are constantly earning the credibility with those fans that they are doing everything reasonably possible to make the safe sport, to make the sport safe. And I think that that's the approach that we should take here as well. We have a moral responsibility. We have a responsibility to our fans to protect the riders, protect the horses, and as we heard from the NIOSH study, uh, protect the participants in the sport from, uh, 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 fr from these injuries. So we know intuitively it's the right thing to do, but what we learn the more we get into it, that it's also good for business. Uh, that we, it will be impossible for us to grow the fan base unless we have earned credibility with new fans who will not accept the status quo that we are doing everything we can to protect our athletic participants. There are several threshold issues to get involved in this, and these are the type of things that we cannot not do. Wager and integrity, uniformity and rules, which we have heard about this morning. Technological innovation should be a common denominator across all this. We should use technology to accomplish all of these other goals. We can't turn our back on any of these four issues and, uh, and we must work together on them. 
As we find ways to work together, all together, one point that I kind of wanted to make that I hadn't heard anything say this morning about, but that I think is something that we should recognize in that in our zeal here at this summit to, uh, uh, to mandate or to uh, require uh, additional safety areas, which, which will sound good here, and make sense here in a larger context, I think we should just have an appropriate footnote about unfunded mandates. That if we mandate new equipment, if we mandate uh, uh, riders to uh, have certain kind of equipment, I think we have to be careful about forcing financial stress on, uh, uh, on exercise riders, for instance, or, or, or others. So I think that's just a point we ought to keep in mind. Also wanted to mention a little bit about uh, the Jockey Health Network. It's, it's a program that uh, started since the first summit. Uh, it is a wonderful example that this industry can work together. Uh, the health records of jockeys are put online in a secure website. I don't see them. No one else that should not see them sees them. And it's a confidential thing that jockeys uh, if they are hurt, uh, now the people treating them at the trauma centers at the racetrack and uh, if necessary as they're transported down to emergency room, the jockey's permanent health history, the ER doctor uh, can have access to that. Uh, the first time we used it, the ER doctor called us, uh, Barry Schumer, our medical director that night. And he said, do you know how rare it is in my line of work to be able to look at medical records of someone coming to an emergency room? He said, what a great, it was a great, great program. And uh, um, so I hope that this is also a program that we continue to endorse uh, on that. I'm gonna, uh, uh, we, we heard a lot this morning. I'm going to talk about in a minute the equine injury database. I think this is a good time for us to take on the challenge of if, we're, if it makes sense to record injuries on our horses, does it also not make sense to record injuries on our riders? Uh, and perhaps uh, everyone on the grounds of a racetrack, but certainly to start out with jockeys and or exercise riders, we should chronicle accidents and take that database and incorporate it into Mick, your database, the injury, uh, equine injury database, and all the rest. So I hope that that's something that gets started. I wanted to mention four areas real quick that uh, to stimulate some discussion. And as we look at these four areas, perhaps we can take the same type of focus that came out of the first summit on track surfaces, which have led to so much of the uh, material improvement, tool improvement, data improvement that we've heard about all morning. Uh, uh, here, here are some areas that, let me just throw out for discussion, can use that same type of collaborative work combining outside expertise with industry expertise. Uh, this year in 2005, as Dr. Peterson just said, he, he didn't know very much about us at all. Now he knows a whole lot about us and has spent a substantial part of his time. So uh, uh, we, we should reach out. One's a starting gate. If you look at starting gates, is probably the most dangerous single moment. Loading in, in, and coming out of the starting gate. And yet we really haven't studied over the years. Most of these starting gates are 50 years old or more. There has been very little improvement done from an engineering standpoint or an analysis standpoint on the starting gate. Woodbine has done some very good work this year and that would be a glaring, ex a wonderful exception uh, to that. But most, uh, most uh, improvements in starting gates have been slow to take place. Most starting gates are leased and as sometimes we in this industry do, we outsmart ourselves. Uh, in the lease it says uh, that any improvements of the starting gate will be paid for by the gate company. And we thought, oh, aren't we clever? And I don't know whether there's coincidence or not, but can't get a gate company to say this is an improvement. <laughs> so uh, uh, we, need to, we need to get around that. So maybe a collaborative effort, engineering, academics, people in the industry, how can we make these uh, the start safer? Same thing with safety rails. 
if you think since the 1970s version of the safety rail, there really hasn't been much research on what should we be doing with a safety rail. Are our assumptions true that you want it slanted or certain materials or uh, uh, l let's see if we can have a collaborative effort on safety rails uh, as well. Uh, helmets. Uh, you're going to hear some in a minute on this panel, I, I suspect, about, about helmets. We should, we should be doing more research and we should be sharing information and uh, this whole question of helmets needs some sunshine. And the same thing about safety vest. Uh, uh, the, the inflatable safety vest that has helped so many other sports, from motorcycle racing to uh, three-day eventing, uh, if you ask the rider on this horse Right now, I think he says that that safety vest that was inflatable probably, uh, if not saved him, certainly was a critical thing. But it doesn't work for us because of the starting gate and premature inflation. And so maybe we ought to, uh, again, reach out and see if there's not some way that we can't uh, um, do some collaboration on safety vest. Uh, the, the whole question of experience the, the, the question of licensing, the question of continuing education, but the question of how you, for instance, let's just take one sliver, how you become a jockey and how, how careful are we uh, in compared to the other sports? Uh, NASCAR, Indy League, what do, they, what do they put their drivers through before they allow them to drive professionally? And perhaps we need to re-examine ourselves on, on licensing and, and uh, 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 at what point a jockey is ready to ride professionally. Dario Franchitti is the winner of the Indianapolis 500. He was here one day, and he had never seen a horse race. And so I took him down on the rail. We literally stood on the track. I stood in front of the starting. He watched the whole thing. They came around, went by him again, and he said, Oh, he said, what they do, what they do is much harder than what I do. He said, first of all, I have a roll bar, I have all this helmet, I have all this equipment. He said, when I go like that, I know the car's going to go that way. He said, they go like that. How do they know? How do they know? I said, would you like to meet some of them? He said, I, I really would. So we went in the jocks room down here, and uh, some of the jockeys were race car fans, so they mobbed him, they knew who he was, and they mobbed him, and they got to talking. And it was amazing to me, I'd, I'd give anything for a video of it, uh, the commonalities of race driving and the, the bond that formed between the jockeys and Dario Franchitti inside of a minute or two. And Dario said, let me ask you guys something. What's the most dangerous thing about your sport? And three or four of the jockeys, whose name you would all recognize, immediately said, without looking at each other, just harmonized, and they said, a bad jockey. And Dario said, that's exactly what I was going to say. It's a bad driver. A good driver in front of me will know. He'll give me, I don't know, he'll give me just enough room that he knows where I am that I can get through and maybe an inch more. No more than that. But he said, a bad driver won't even know that I'm there, much less how much room to give me. And they, there was a great dialogue that the exact same thing was true, that these jockeys said the most scariest thing about race would be a bad jockey. And... So perhaps standards in that area would be looking at. We, t we heard a little bit about, uh, or a lot today, and we're going to hear more for years and years about the surface and the rider. Uh, and that's a critical area. But I think it's equally important as we get through these summits, uh, Dr. Stover's point this morning, that there are a number of criteria, and we can't afford to turn our back on any of them. Uh, it's not a surprise to anybody in this room that knows me. I'm a huge proponent of these new surfaces. I think that uh, the racetrack that I know the most, this is a huge step forward from anything that we've had here before. I also think that when we meet here 10 years from now, vertical drainage will be the standard. Vertical drainage is so much better, in my opinion, than all the things you have to do when you're playing uh, a, a gravity game on how you manipulate moisture. As, as you heard Dr. Peterson today, so much about racetrack consistency is all about how you manage moisture and manipulate moisture, if you will. Uh, so I'm uh, 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 no question where I stand on that, 
But I also don't think that it's a single solution, and I don't think it ought to be forced on other racetracks. And I don't think it should be mandated. And, and uh, it, you, you have to be passionate, and the whole team has to be on board to make these things work and learn. And that's the way to go forward on this. The, um, I thought I, uh, we, we heard uh, Doctor today talk about one year's worth of data. And I took some of the categories that I thought he might say this morning and took a guess. And I thought that you might enjoy getting the statistics from Keeneland since 2006, since that, this is the one we know, and take a look at the, some of the same breakdown since 2006. Uh, I didn't know how he was going to do it, so we, I took a guess on the graphs and charts. This pie chart here is broken down by the type of race. And the numbers are uh, the number of fatalities we've had since 06 in each one of those categories. Allowance, uh, claiming stakes, maiden claiming. So I was... Uh, uh, um, we did the same thing by distance. I thought he might do distance. The first line uh, uh, are amount of 16th races. As you can tell, we run more amount of 16th races than anything else. Then down 6-7. Uh, and the link, the, 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 how far the, the, the category goes is the number of races. And then the number on top would be if we had a fatality at that distance. So you see uh, amount of 16th, we've run the most races of any, and we've only had one fatality in that distance since 2006 fall. Uh, six furlongs, we've had four, and if I'm not mistaken, two of those were on the same day. And it, it was a record weather day. So we think we, we tragically learned something that day. But, but um, uh, again, uh, again, the, the four-year history of, of, uh, of distance. Same thing with um, surface. We've, we've had... Uh, Almost 8,000 starts and then uh, almost 2,000 starts on the turf and the hurdle. And you, you see how it breaks down there, the numbers do. So uh, the, since January 1, two th 2007, on both of our tracks, uh, we've had uh, 10 fatalities out of 9,934 starts. Uh, on the poly track since October of 06, we've had 10 fatalities out of 9,662 starts for one. Uh, that's our number. I know that a number of the other tracks are going to release their data, and hooray. Uh, this is on our website, and will continue to be updated on our website. We think that openness and transparency is the right way to go. Uh, I, I commend the tracks that are that are going to release their data. I think there's a whole lot that's good about the injury, equine injury database that needs to keep going and, and going on. But I, I do wish that, um, uh, that that data could be released by track and data could be released by trainer as well. Um, but I but, uh, understand there are reasons that it can't be. So um, with that, we'll be available for the, or for the questions later, but I thought that you might enjoy seeing those numbers. Thank you. Our next speaker on this group is uh, Dr. Hall, uh, Dr. Edward Hall, who's the director of the Spinal Cord and Brain Injury uh, Research Center at University of Kentucky, and he has a uh, short presentation on this. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peterson, and uh, thank you, Mr. Bowen, for inviting me. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm a new face to everybody in the group except uh, a couple of people. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, one of the most devastating human injuries that occur uh, that can occur to anyone, uh, but in this context, uh, jockeys, uh, is to sustain a, a brain or a spinal cord injury. The nervous system defines who we are, defines our ability to move and interact with our environment. And if we have a, a significant neurological impairment secondary to an injury to our brain or spinal cord, it, believe me, it is a very life-changing uh, event. 
And um, so uh, I want to tell you a little bit about our uh, center. We've become involved uh, in uh, working with the uh, Jockeys Guild during the last year and have enjoyed that relationship. So uh, for those of you who are native Kentuckians, you can be hopefully uh, somewhat proud of uh, the fact that uh, the state of Kentucky has uh, become uh, one of the leaders in this area of research uh, devoted to spinal cord or brain injury. Uh, there are, in fact, uh, two centers uh, devoted to this uh, area, are the University of Kentucky Spinal Cord and Brain Injury Research Center that I head up, also known as SCOBERC for short. And in addition, about the same time that we were formed, the University of Louisville uh, formed something that uh, uh, somewhat annoyingly called the Kentucky Spinal Cord Injury Research Center. I would prefer it be called the University of Louisville uh, Spinal Cord Research Center, but we have a close personal relationship with them. Both of these centers uh, have, uh, uh, were inspired by the creation of something called the Kentucky Spinal Cord and Head Injury Research Trust, which was the brainchild of uh, Senator, uh, State Senator Tim Shaughnessy, uh, who uh, represent much of the uh, Louisville area. And um, uh, the reason that he became interested in this uh, over almost uh, 20 years ago was he had a, a, his niece sustained a spinal cord injury uh, related to an automobile accident, like so many, when she was a teenager. And as she was being treated and, and was looking, uh, had a life of uh, permanent uh, uh, quadriplegia, that is, uh, uh, paralysis of her arms and legs with some limited ability to move her arms. Uh, obviously, he and his family became very interested in the problem of spinal cord injury. And being a very proactive individual, when he found out there was not much going on in the state of Kentucky to address these uh, devastating injuries, uh, he uh, went back to the legislature and pushed forward a bill to create the Kentucky Spinal Cord and Head Injury Research Trust. Uh, which would fund uh, research at the University of Louisville or the University of Kentucky to try to deal with this, uh, this problem. In 1994, that went into place, and if you've ever gotten a speeding ticket in the last 16 years in the state of Kentucky, um, you have made a donation to this trust fund, and you've made a donation to our research in, uh, at, uh, here at UK as well as at, at, in Louisville. Uh, we also, however, even though we get uh, the fund generates about $3 million a year, the surcharge is about $12.50 uh, if you get a speeding ticket. I made my first donation. I've been here eight years, and I made my first donation three years ago on the way back from uh, a very enjoyable day at the Kentucky Derby and uh, got my first, made my first donation on, um, on uh, Route 60 just outside of Versailles, uh, which is a real speed trap. Uh, but it's the only time I've ever gotten a speeding ticket that I actually uh, felt like saying, thank you, officer. I appreciate that. Uh, so uh, anyway, but thank you if uh, you've made a donation uh, to us. Uh, our center that I direct is uh, on the corner of Virginia and Limestone, the top of the uh, what's called the Biomedical and Biological Sciences Research Building. And we've been in there for, uh, for five and a half years. We have essentially the entire fourth floor. Um, I'm the director, Dr. Jim Geddes, who was the first to form a connection with, uh, uh, with the Jockeys Guild uh, when he met uh, Terry Meeks on an uh, airplane, uh, is our associate director and was in fact the first director of our center when it was formed in 1999. Pat Sullivan is an associate director, and then we have two very fine ladies who do all of our administrative work, and then our clinical director is Dr. Byron Young, who was formerly chairman of neurosurgery at UK. Uh, has now stepped down from that, although he's still director of the Kentucky Neuroscience Institute. Also, Dr. Joe Springer is another one of our leaders. He's the Cardinal Hill Endowed Chair in uh, uh, Neuro Rehabilitation and spends about half of his time uh, over at Cardinal Hill and half of his time uh, in our uh, center. Now, there's a lot of words on here. Let me just uh, uh, sum it up and say our mission uh, statement involves that we're trying to come up with uh, treatments uh, for head and spinal cord injury that will either uh, involve protecting the nervous system following an injury during the critical first minutes and hours, uh, many different pharmacological treatments uh, we're currently looking at, and then about half of our effort is focused on trying to uh, uh, find ways that after an injury has occurred, how can we try to stimulate recovery, uh, functional recovery, uh, regeneration of nerve cells so that recovery uh, can take place, and very importantly, we're a very translational center that hopes to discover things in the, in the laboratory that we can move into clinical trials in a reasonable period of time. 
Um, spinal cord injury, uh, there are only about 11,000 spinal cord injuries in the United States every year. That number has been very stable over many, many years, uh, unfortunately, despite improvements and, and seat, seat belt laws and the like. Uh, and it's a small number of patients compared to a lot of things, but if you're one of those that has a spinal cord injury or somebody in your family sustains it, it's a very, very big deal uh, to you. Most spinal cord injuries do not involve actual physical cutting or transection of the cord. That's the good news. Uh, but the bad news is that you can still have a life-altering injury that even though the cord is not cut initially, the cord is contused or bruised or stretched or twisted in a way that damages the nerve fibers that uh, are contained in the spinal cord. And this is just a, a couple of uh, uh, depictions of, of what that would look like. But the fact that the spinal cord is initially intact suggests that if you could surgically go in and remove those bones that are pressing on the spinal cord and administer a drug or, or uh, administer ice cold saline to lower body temperature, which is another approach that's being looked at, that you might be able to save enough of those nerve fibers uh, in order to get neurological recovery. The primary injury we talk about is simply the mechanical trauma that takes place. We can't do anything about that except try to regrow uh, nerve fibers after they've been lost or regrow blood vessels that have been damaged. But most of the injury uh, is a secondary event that involves progressive damage to the blood vessels and to the nerve cells. In other words, the wires that go up and down the spinal cord, uh, creating damage to those wires or the insulation around those wires uh, that we realize that we have the potential to do something about. The secondary injury begins within seconds after injury and, and proceeds over the next uh, several days and, and perhaps even longer. Uh, if you look, just look now, this is a depiction, this is a spinal cord from an experimental animal, uh, actually a cat. This is a normal cross-section of the spinal cord. You see surround the wires are in the outer part of the cord, that sort of light-colored area. And then the pink central area is where the nerve cells make contact with motor nerve cells that go out to our muscles and control our movement. Well, if we injure that cord by compressing it for just five minutes and we take off the compression, you see that within the center of the cord, you get these small hemorrhages that begin to take place due to damage to the blood vessels. And then as uh, time goes by, uh, those hemorrhages become worse and worse, and pretty, mu uh, pretty soon all of the central uh, area of the spinal cord becomes very hemorrhagic. Then what takes place between minutes and, and days is that gradually there's destruction of that uh, centralized tissue of the spinal cord, and you're left eventually with just a rim of tissue uh, that has uh, less than the normal number of nerve fibers, and also another issue is not just how many nerve fibers, but is the insulation of those wires, uh, which is known as myelin, is that, uh, is that preserved? So it's possible to have sustain a spinal cord injury, have a significant amount of damage, as I'm showing you, and still get some neurological recovery. But obviously, the more tissue we try to save, uh, the better the chance of getting recovery. Well, there's one treatment available right now uh, that's used for treating acute spinal cord injuries has to be given during the first eight hours if it's going to be used, and that's the steroid drug methylprednisolone, uh, which was uh, discovered by my colleagues and I over 20 years ago um, when I was at the Northeastern Ohio University's College of Medicine to be effective in improving neurological recovery in animal models of spinal cord injury if it was given early and if it was given in high doses. That led to a clinical trial which was published around 1990, uh, which revolutionized the, the treatment of spinal cord injury, and methylprednisolone, uh, the steroid drug, became the standard of care for many uh, years to come. And it's the only treatment that's available for treating spinal cord injuries at this point, other than experimental treatments. And what that drug did was, if it was administered in the first eight hours, you see in the blue bars here in this graph, that the patients treated with methylprednisolone had a, a significantly improved neurological recovery compared to patients that didn't get the steroid drug. Well, let me just turn quickly to the bigger issue uh, in terms of the numbers anyway of traumatic brain injury, uh, larger population, about 1.5 million uh, brain injuries uh, each year. 
Uh, not all of the people that sustain these uh, get, get medical care. Some people that have concussions uh, just shake it off, which is unfortunate. But some are admitted to the hospital and have varying degrees of severe uh, injuries. Uh, brain injury, like spinal cord injury, is a mechanical event. Uh, the uh, the uh, rather gruesome diagram of a human brain on the uh, left-hand side in the upper uh, left is a, uh, a bullet wound, of course, very devastating. Uh, but injuries can occur from uh, uh, ladders, from automobile accidents, uh, from sporting accidents, uh, uh, as seen there. And, of course, in the war on terror, uh, the improvised explosive devices as depicted in the lower left-hand uh, corner. Uh, the pathophysiology of brain injury is uh, more complex than it is with spinal cord injury, and it's a mixture of uh, brain swelling and also hemorrhages called hematomas that form uh, on the surface of the brain that press in on the brain and cause a stroke-like uh, secondary injury. But basically, the mechanisms involved in that injury are the same as you see in spinal cord injury. Uh, the upper left-hand corner shows uh, a brain of somebody who sustained a brain injury, a diffuse brain injury, and uh, did not survive. They died at six days post-injury. And when you looked at their brain microscopically, you see these dark, light, shrunken nerve cells that represent what we call diffuse neuronal uh, nerve cell injury. We can also model that in, uh, in rats and mice. And if you look at the lower uh, panels, you'll see that we can get that same phenomenon uh, in animals subjected to experimental injuries under appropriate anesthesia. The, the complexity of this secondary injury is extraordinary, and there are many different players that are involved, whether it be spinal cord or brain injury. But over the last 20 years, we've answered a lot of questions as to what are the key molecular issues and physiological issues that participate in this secondary injury and, and what we might uh, be able to do about it. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner, I'll call your attention to uh, something called free radicals. That's something my research has been focused on for many years. And it's free radical damage uh, that plays a key role. And that's what the high-dose steroid treatment is designed to stop, is to inhibit the damage produced by free radicals. More recently, we're looking at a multiple kinds of approaches that we might use simultaneously to block the injury. Now, these are uh, all of my colleagues. There are nine of us in the Scoberg uh, core faculty uh, in the building on the quarter of Virginia and Limestone. About half of us are working on ways to protect the brain and spinal cord during the first uh, several hours. And about half of us are working on ways to try to promote recovery, achieve regeneration uh, of nerve fibers after they've been damaged. We have an even larger, broader group of uh, part-time investigators, you might say, faculty associates at UK who are also involved in our research, and these are both basic scientists and clinicians. Our current strengths, as I sort of implied, are we're working on what's called acute neuroprotection, looking for ways to protect the injured nervous system, stop this secondary injury. Uh, we're particularly interested in free radical-induced oxidative damage, uh, calcium flooding of nerve cells also plays a role. Damage to the cellular mitochondria is particularly critical, and we have some interesting ways to try to block that. We're also working on promotion of axonal sprouting. Uh, the axons are the wires in the spinal cord or brain that are damaged, and we're trying to find ways to regenerate those and get them to make new connections and restore activity. We're also working on some of the secondary characteristic aspects of uh, spinal cord injury that uh, maybe don't relate to paralysis, but also affect the quality of life, like spasticity, pain, and also a condition called autonomic dysreflexia. And then more recently, our newest initiative is to try to tackle the, the very big problem of mild traumatic brain injury. Uh, most of our research uh, during my career has been focused on the more moderate to severe injuries because they're quite frankly easier to model in the laboratory. But 90% of traumatic brain injuries are mild. Many of them in the, in the sporting context are referred to as concussions. But the consequences of those can be devastating, whether they be to jockeys or uh, to other athletes or, or individuals. So we're trying to model that 
And we're finding that all of our mechanisms that we've studied in the more severe injuries are just simply scaled down for the most part in the case of the mild. So we think that maybe some of the same treatments might be relevant, but on the other hand, other kinds of approaches might be uh, what's called for. Um, we're currently, uh, just one thing and then I'm, I'm done, is uh, uh, at the top of this is some of our current translational projects and we're in the process of uh, starting a clinical trial of a drug called cyclosporin uh, for severe traumatic brain injury. This drug is actually used if, if uh, uh, somebody has a kidney transplant or a liver transplant or anything like a lung transplant. They're treated chronically with this drug to prevent uh, rejection of that transplanted organ. But uh, my colleagues have found that this drug is also very good at protecting the, uh, the injured brain. We're also looking at an analog of that, which we think will do the same thing in spinal cord injury. So uh, thank you very much. This is just a picture of our overall group um, in the, uh, uh, the William T. Young Library. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hall. <clears throat> um, one of the things you notice, the causal web that uh, kind of matches uh, between uh, some of the stuff Tim Parkin was talking about as well as Dr. Hall. And I mean, but if, from an industry standpoint, we have things where we have to address if there's even one injury, one severe injury that's associated with a particular problem, we have to address it if we can. So there's this reality of addressing issues that are immediately sitting in front of us. I guess probably the first one I see on that list is probably uh, Gates, uh, and maybe I'll start out with Mike. Maybe we'd like to start talking about uh, what we've got out there for standards for Gates and some opinions. Nope. Hello. I don't have control. No, there we go. <laughs> this, basically, I'm going to reiterate what Nick said. Um, the starting gate, generally, the equipment is extremely old, and from what I've seen at 18 tracks around North America, the, the only track with new starting gate equipment is Woodbine. They've done an outstanding job with their equipment. More importantly, um, specifications put out by a manufacturer do not, to me, make standards. I think we need to look, as Nick said, as an industry, get all the parties affected involved, which includes jockeys, trainers, owners, organizations like mine together and form a minimum standard, put it through the model rules process, and then get this equipment that's potentially outdated, potentially unsafe, fixed or replaced. Until we do that, we're relying on unbelievably old equipment and the most potentially dangerous part of the racetrack. Uh, I think Nick and Bob may have other comments on that. Bob? I would disagree. Just Bob or Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I should be more specific. Robert and Bob, do you want to continue? No, <laughs> oh, please start. No, no. Go ahead. Uh, this is an interesting group for me to be with. Uh, uh, my perspective, my take on it is from a totally different direction. And uh, uh, much of what we do around the starting gate is important in the way of repairs and, and, and improving padding and helmets and vests and whatnot. But uh, my approach to it is uh, based on some history I've had on the starting gate. Uh, I can tell you that I've been on the gate for over 40 years, and, and the first 25 or 30, 30 years of my career was spent doing it the hard way, which was the traditional way we were taught. It involved a lot of force and uh, pushing and shoving and macho handling of horses and doing what we could, trying to do a good job, being uh, uh, very prideful, wa wanting to do a good job, wanting to be good at what we did. but. Uh, we would run out of ideas, and when we ran out of ideas and we were in a rush in the morning, it would, we'd resort to pushing horses into the starting gate or pulling out a buggy whip and chasing them in with a buggy whip and basically containing the horse in the gate and being rather successful in getting them in the gate, but not really bringing their mind and their mindset in there in the right, uh, in the right place. And so, so, you know, we took pride in our work, but we, we weren't really looking at the consequences of our work. Uh, some of which might be a poor performance because the horse was somewhat traumatized by how we handled them. Uh, our schooling process wasn't so much a teaching technique, although we thought we were teaching. We would teach them how to break from the gate and then we would hopefully teach them to stand well on the gate. But a lot of the times we were just putting a Band-Aid on a, on a, on a, 
on a, a problem and not really finding a cure. We were treating symptoms and not searching for the disease or the cause of the disease. Uh, fortunately for me, uh, as I gained in seniority on my crew in New York, uh, I was able to start to look at different ways of handling horses in the gate. And it eventually led me, at the, about the time I became the starter in the early 90s, to uh, search outside the starting gate and, and, uh, and, and talk to horsemen that weren't necessarily involved in racing, but who had a very different uh, take on how horses should be handled, uh, what, what methods could be used to not just physically cause a change in the horse, but to mentally cause a change in the horse. Uh, I mention this because I think this is truly the answer to what this panel is reaching for today. I mean, we can fix all the equipment in the world, but when a horse explodes in the starting gate and winds up upside down, the best vest and the best helmet is not going to save his life. Uh, this is an issue that uh, affects the horses, the riders, the assistant starters. There's, it, it's a dangerous place. So this, the, what, what I learned, and I'll try not to be uh, too uh, lengthy with this, uh, by talking to these people was that if you could get a basic understanding of how horses interact with each other in a herd hierarchy, if you can see how leadership is established in a herd, you can apply these techniques in your work with the, with the horse in, in, his, in his daily life, and you can g gain a relationship with the horse that suddenly changes how he feels about you and how he feels about what you would ask him to do. And it begins with a language. Uh, the language is just movement. Uh, in a herd, the dominant horse can cause the other horse to move out of his way. So we take that knowledge and we now know that we can take a horse in our hands behind the starting gate or elsewhere. It's really something that should start when he's a baby, but uh, in our case, a lot of times he's first experience, experiencing this behind the gate. You can take a horse in your hands and create movement with him by simply asking him to move backward and come forward and move left and right, either his hind end or his front end. And as you're moving him, an anxious horse who is concerned about the gate suddenly starts to lock onto you and look at you differently. And instead of you being uh, uh, the enemy, uh, something, you know, he's, in a, he's, he's afraid, he's in a place that uh, he, he doesn't know what's going to happen to him, suddenly he looks to you for leadership and, and for help. Uh, he, look, he, he looks to you for, for uh, safety and comfort. So you get this horse moving around like that, and suddenly you can now present an obstacle to the horse, like the star gate or loading on a van or in and out of your stall or anything, and, and this horse has a different attitude. It, it's often referred to the, the horse being right-brained or left-brained. A right-brained horse is a flighty horse. His response to danger is to flee or fight. And fleeing is their first choice in most of these cases. But if you can change this horse's mind and make a connection to him, you can keep them thinking from their left brain side, which is more of a rational side. It's, it's a trialing side, as the, as the Australian uh, uh, behaviorists refer to it. And, and by a lot, keeping a horse in this state of mind and, be, and having the skills and learning the skills to create leadership and build trust, suddenly you can present an obstacle like the starting gate to the horse, and the horse is more willing to accept it if you follow the process along. Now, you're really getting the abbreviated version of what this is, but I can tell you that the difference was so dramatic that from the day that I began to learn it, I, would, I, I studied it constantly for years and, and reached out to every clinician I could find, trying to think outside the traditional box of racing uh, knowledge. and. Uh, the, tr the change for me was dramatic. It changed my life, it changed the horses' lives who I work with. Uh, that to me is the key to our success in safety around the starting gate. It's the, it's the key to our success in safety in racing. It's the, it, it, the safety rail is a wonderful thing, but wouldn't it be great if our riders had more skill based on, on knowledge of horsemanship so that they would be able to guide the horse? Let's have the skill so that when that horse goes into the race, he's confident to run straight. And things don't scare him. He doesn't duck uh, because of, uh, of a lack of training and foundation. Uh, it applies in the stable area. The, the, it's a funny thing about our game. We, 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 take, we have multi-million dollar horses, and the person who spends the most time with them is his groom and his hot walker, and his hot walker is an entry-level position with probably the least, the, the least skill of anybody on the job, and yet he's probably going to have the horse in his hands for an hour, an hour and a half a day. So. My proposal is, is larger than just safety equipment, uh, uh, Mick. It's about education. It's about teaching our people how to handle horses. It, this, this isn't rocket science. I mean, everybody can learn this. And if we could just teach a fundamental amount of this knowledge to people and get them started, most people will continue with the education themselves. And I would think that wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if a fellow comes on the track and he gets his license to be a, a hot walker or a groom, and we say, well, okay, we'll give you that license, but it's provisional, and 
hopefully somewhere down the road this next year or so, Dr. Reed McClellan will come in with the Groom Elite program and, and he'll have a segment of it that's on understanding horses, understanding their nature, knowing why they do what they do. Because until you get to that, you're still going to have those explosions in the starting gate. Thanks. I, I mean, I should pass that off. I mean, this obviously is relevant. <laughs> Well, Robert and Jeff, I think, will probably react to both of that, right? I think Robert wanted to go. I don't think I want to follow him. I don't think I can put it <laughs> as eloquently or as intellectually as he has. And I just agree totally that it, it's as much schooling for the humans as, as it is the horses. There it was said earlier by Mr. Nicholson, you know, what is uh, one of the worst things for a rider is a bad rider. Well, it was just the same way in the starting gate. There were certainly guys I wanted to, to handle me, and there were a lot of guys I did not want handling me, and I'd just soon be in there by myself, you know, or a rider beside you. There's nothing that sets off a horse quicker than a nervous rider or handler. Yeah. Well, I think this is one of those topics that, uh, you know, it, the starting gates are there every race. It's a part of the racing game, and it, it kind of gets overlooked. But when the riders go and visit Woodbine, they come back and say, wow, they have a, a fantastic gate up there. Or Keeneland's is, is, uh, is great. But they don't realize it until they've been in one that, that's better than what they're used to. And it's the same way with a handler. They get a good handler, and everybody wants that guy. And it's, it's topics like this that I commend the Grayson, Grayson uh, Research and Keeneland for bring to the forefront and hopefully out of these these two day session this will be one thing that we can continue to focus on and, and it won't be overlooked in the future i guess i i, I don't know if i'm the only one here but i i, I somebody who's seen the uh, woodbine gate uh, can can you tell us what what what's different and what what you liked about it maybe Jeff? i can't I, I haven't been there robert have you seen it or mike can you mike i know you well, believe it or not i've actually never broken from that gate but i will <laughs> tell you that um they put a lot of thought into it. The, the thing that struck me, besides padding, which we see at a lot of places, the, the floats going into the gate where the, there's no potential for a horse to rear up and get stuck up on top. They're mounted at an angle so that the horse's hooves will slide right off of it. There's no, the, the gate pops without sound. It's hydraulic, so it's a, instead of what we're used to seeing here in the States, which is a reverse magnet, when the power's cut off, the gate pops and you hear it. It's sort of startling. There's no sound to it. All you hear is the bell, which is what they're used to hear, which is what they should be trained to starting with. Uh, they race at night there. There's a light in every single stall as opposed to one at the end, so everybody has a really good view for what you're looking for. Um, the load in is a little different. It's not straight in, which gives the horse a chance to turn sideways. It has to come in a little bit of an angle so that it, it, it can't get jarred sideways and start hurting its flank against the side of the, of the um, back gate. So what it boils down to is, beyond the fact that they, they had the, the wherewithal to spend the money on it, they actually did the research, and I think they talked to a lot of people involved and, and really were conscientious about it. Good design. I mean, there might have even been a trainer involved in it and, they, and, and, and a starter and everybody else involved in the design process from the very beginning and then attuned. Um, well, Mike, speak a little bit more about the padding that you've seen as you're going through through the accreditation process uh, uh, on the gates, particularly. Sure. Um, the second time I've had this conversation today, I, I, I implement good rules, and there is not a good rule when it comes to padding in the starting gate. The model rule says a starting gate must be padded. There's absolutely no definition of what that means. It could be a quarter inch, it could be two inches. There's no definition. Another quick step that we could take is figuring out as scientifically as we can what would be the best case scenario for padding and get that adopted into a model rule <clears throat> so that when we go on the accreditation inspections, we have a standard to point to Again, it's not a manufacturer's specification, but it's a scientifically based standard that we can say, this passes and this doesn't, because right now we don't have that. Padding can be eye in the all in the eye of the beholder. If somebody tells me it's padding and I look at it and say, yeah, that could be padding, but until I have that actual standard, which we need desperately, that's what we're going with. So is it fair to say part of it would be a performance standard that you're looking for rather than just a specification with, you know, 
Well, sure, and we've had the conversation Design. separately about potentially looking at scientific research put into things like judo mats, which yep. are, are maybe a good starting point because they have testing based on compression, best taste on, uh, based on impact, which we could make a good starting point for the starting gate. So do like I've done with the lab and copy when you can and innovate when you have to, right? Yeah, <laughs> what you said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about, uh, as particularly those of you who've ridden, um, let's talk a, bit, a little bit about rails. I mean, that was really the second one that Nick specifically mentioned. Uh, uh, maybe, Jeff, you wouldn't mind starting out talking about safety rails and what you see and what, where we've been. Uh, well, there's, there's so many things in this entry industry that you, you feel should be no-brainers. If you've seen accidents involving a regular rail and then accidents involving a safety rail and the success stories, um, a picture of Julian Le Peru going over the inside fence at, at Keeneland, bouncing back and riding the next race, I mean, that's, that's a story in itself that should, should convince everybody. But for whatever reasons, whether it's... Uh, um, tracks that say they can't afford it or they can't decide what's, uh, what the correct rail is for them or one track says that it, they're in a floodplain, they're afraid it's going to float away. It, 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 I mean, that's one issue, as far as I'm concerned, every track needs to implement and I hope it happens soon. Robert, did you want to add to that? I, I, I would just agree with Jeff that, you know, it's, it should be something that should be implemented at every track. There's, there's you know, I know there's the the investment costs associated with it, but, you know, when you're laying in a hospital bed, you know, that cost uh, looks a little differently. Um, Nick, is there anything you can comment on that specifically? I mean, there's obviously a financial issue on this and, and, and such. And, and, and anything you want to add on how those decisions are made? I mean, that's not simple, is it? Well, it's not simple, Mick. And I think that one of the keys to the areas that you've heard today, this morning, of progress in the first two summits was collaboration, and it's collaboration from people inside the industry where you take the expertise of experienced uh, uh, jockeys, trainers, track owners, uh, uh, Bob Duncan's horsemanship is something that should be talked about a lot more than it is, and, and we ought to find a way to incorporate more than it is, but then also reach out to people from outside the industry. Uh, I remember the first time you were at Keeneland, uh, Mick, when uh, he shows up on Thanksgiving morning and uh, just starts measuring this track. And Mike Young calls me at home and he said, there's some guy with a truck on a track on Thanksgiving Day. And it turns out to be Mick Peterson, so it was a great day. Uh, but uh, the combination of outside expertise of people like Dr. Hall that are working on on somewhat similar things might give us access to materials that we don't know about or new modern uh, uh, heavy or lightweight or or redesign of helmets or vests or rails or, or whatever. So I, I, I would hope that it would be an industry commitment and collaboration of the expertise and the horse expertise, but also uh, let's not be parochial here and let's reach out uh, to people like Dr. Peterson uh, who, who might end up in a few years being being wonderful additions to the industry. You, you brought up a good question there, and I, I, I guess I'll pass that on to Jeff and uh, uh, Robert in particular. Uh, what about the kind of pushback we've seen on some of the model rules for vests and helmets? Uh, do, you have, do you have thoughts on what we're seeing and kind of how, what the dynamic is behind that? Well, I think, I think part of it, and, and Nick brought up a, a very important topic in his presentation, um, a jockey research database or jockey injury database. The, the new rules, model rules, have been implemented. And when they first came to me a few years ago, I had just started in this position and asked me to review the VEST rules. One of the executive directors of the Racing Commission had gone through the room and, and review, looked at some of the VESTs that were hanging on the wall and he said they'd removed padding and there were no labels on it and he didn't know if it was an approved vest or not and he went back and looked at his, his rule and it was a rule for beta 5. And he said the beta 5 was replaced in, in the year 2000. This is nine years, we're nine years past due of going back and, and keeping up with these regulations and, and he, he gave me the opportunity to help draft the new model rule. 
But when you look at, at the research in North America, we have none. There was no jockey injury database. We didn't know what types of vests were being used, um, what types of injuries were occurring, how many injuries, whether they were a vest could have helped, whether they were collarbone or, or ribs or, or spinal injuries or whatever. There was there's no data available. So if, if there's one thing that can come out of this summit from this panel or, or the discussions tomorrow, I would hope that, that we can get enough people involved in, in putting together a jockey injury database so we can start looking at this. And in the future, in four years, we can give, I can be up here giving a presentation like was given on the horse injury database to say, you know, here's the statistics, and this is the helmet that was worn in this, this accident, and here's the, the vest that was worn in this accident, and here's what the research shows, and, and give a, a a recommendation based on science on what we need to be developing our model rules or, or state regulations on in the future. Great. Robert, I, I, and you've got a couple other topics. Yes. I certainly um, first, I would occur with um, Jeff, and the only part I would add on that is that we include, you know, all riders, exercise, and jockeys into that if we're starting at, at the beginning of it. Um, just have a few items that I'd like to, to go over for a, a safer racing item. Uh, one of the things that, that, that probably contributed to the safest uh, racing that we have in Delaware is a local safety committee. You know, a lot of your issues, national issues that we're dealing here, you know, it, you still have to deal with the injury that's, that's at the track. And a lot of your, your issues are local, you know, the way the traffic flows onto the, onto the track, uh, some idiot that's looking for me every day when I'm coming by and going to throw a garbage sack off the third floor of the grandstand, and next thing I know, horse is wheeled and I'm standing there on the ground. Well, what we did, we formed a safety committee about four years ago. We have every department, we have the general manager, head of the horseman, head of the commission, the legal opinion, you know, our, uh, I should say the track attorney, everybody that, that, that we need to make the decision then, that there's no let's wait for tomorrow. So any issues are dealt with immediately and, and we do, you know, from trivial stuff to, um, we dealt with the uh, uh, Christian Whip a couple years well before a bells broke down we were actually testing prototypes two years before she broke down and had mandatory use of the whip a um, couple years prior to that so i would you know, strongly recommend you know a local safety committee the other item that, that 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 i would really push strong would be a track warning system we need a track warning system in every track in the united states that is uniform in uniform and standards that sound has to be identical so that every individual on the track knows exactly what that sound is, no matter what track you're at. It has to be uniform in placement, and it has to be uniform in procedures and enforcement. We, we use a dual system that has lights and sirens. In the morning, the lights and sirens go off. You're to pull those horses up immediately. It's a $2,500 fine first offense for many of the individuals that don't do it. In the afternoon, the lights come on to warn the riders if there's a loose horse, or there's a situation you're to continue riding with caution. If the siren comes on, it's to be, you're to pull up immediately. Not only are the procedures explained to the end users by the form of a, a form, when you come in there to get licensed, you have to sign a form, you have to take it to the exercise, or I'm sorry, to the outriders, and it's, it's explained to you um, both verbally and then you have to sign and, and witness that you know the rules. In addition, for anybody new coming, um, for exercise riders, the, the outrider has to view them and d determine whether or not they have the sufficient skills to be out there. And it, we've also empowered our outriders that at any time if somebody is uh, incapable of handling a horse or a horse that's, that's unruly can be removed at any time. So I would you know, strongly recommend that we come up with a track warning system. A lot of this stuff is going to be in the work group tomorrow that I've um, submitted extensively. You mentioned earlier the helmets and vest. Um, there's just a lot of confusion on the helmets and vests when you visit the various commissions, um, both on the standards and the products. And I think it's time for some national entity to step up and say, all right, we're going to regulate the standards, be it the RCI or the NTRA, put them on a website and saying, here's the standards. Um, you know, we let the standard bodies uh, uh, determine them, let the, the scientific and medical field determine them. We're just saying, all right, these are the standards for helmet and the vest. We, we go according to the standard, we require a record of test. So each manufacturer for each product has to have a record of test nationally for that product. And then on the website, we put all the products that
that can be used. If that product's not on that list, don't bring it on the track and don't allow the vendors to sell it on the track. Um, I think that, you know, that, that by developing this, we have a process to bring in other safety equipment, um, you know, uh, such as the track warning system or even riding crops that have to meet a, uh, a certain standard and then you have that manufacturer meet that. And if they don't meet it, it would be described right on it. You know, or, I mean, they would not be allowed to sell it. And finally, the, the other item that I would like to push is what I would call an unsafe um, horse database. If a horse makes a vet list, a steward's list, a starter's list, or a paddock list, there's no method right now currently for a jockey to know that, especially a horse that's been removed from it. You know, horses are habits of creatures, or, or I should say creatures of habit. And a lot of times they'll do the same thing in a similar situation. They might not do it every race, but for a rider that, that, that's on a horse for the first time that's shipped in from another track, you have no idea that this horse is flipped in the starting gate. You have no idea the horse is bolted from the one hole. I think that, that any time a horse makes one of these lists, that, that information should be permanently archived and the rider should have a right to that information, should be disseminated freely to them so they can go look a horse up and you know, both protect both themselves and the other horses and riders in the race. So those, those are some of the ideas that uh, I've submitted and we'll be talking about tomorrow in the group, work group. And that's good input, and, and, and I think those are key issues. And one thing that I, 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 in, that's interesting to me particularly is mentioning uh, uh, testing of vests, because there is an ASTM standard for vests that's associated with, uh, with, with equestrian activities. And, and the interesting thing is that we haven't integrated that into our rules, as far as I know. Uh, maybe Dr. Hall can uh, speak a little bit to the, the role of safety equipment in traumatic brain injury, uh, where I, certainly helmets have a plethora of, uh, of test standards, and then you're probably aware of some of the other sports and what they've done. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's, it's very important to try to improve uh, at, you know, helmet design. It, it, it impresses me that uh, since I've gotten involved in this a little bit and begun to think about it, that, that relatively little has been done compared to football and, and uh, NASCAR racing and, and uh, auto racing in general to, to really look scientifically at some of the issues of, of what jockeys are, are uh, susceptible to, the types of falls, the types of injuries they might sustain, and then try to generate uh, an improved helmet uh, to, to deal with those. Uh, certainly the helmets that I've seen uh, recently visited uh, uh, Chris McCarran's school and he showed us, you know, sort of the state-of-the-art helmet, which is definitely an improvement over the sort of old eggshell uh, approach, which uh, did little more, I'm sure, than just uh, reduce the chance of uh, skull fractures. Uh, but I, I think we need to try to optimize the, the uh, helmet design so that it absorbs as much energy as possible. And I'm not aware of much that's been done in, in the racing world uh, in that regard. Now, having said that, I also made the point at lunch that that um, uh, that the biomechanics are such that whenever you have, uh, you know, a racing injury, whether it's in a car or or whatever it's in, it involves a sudden stop. And and while the head may hit some hard surface or soft surface, uh, it's it's going to come to a quick stop. And you may prevent the skull fracture with a helmet, but that isn't going to stop the brain from sloshing around back and forth inside the head. And so you have. Uh, both forward and backward uh, kind of bouncing movements as well as if you have a rotational injury where the head is doing one of these real fast, then the brain is rotating inside the skull and no helmet of any type is really going to stop uh, that. So while there's a place for improved helmet design to try to decrease the chance of skull fractures and uh, um, uh, depress skull fractures that cause uh, tissue damage from fragments of the skull, uh, you, you need other ways to approach the injury as well and that's why we continue to work on, on treatments that will uh, reduce the damage after it's occurred. One other thing in that regard I wanted to point out that, that I think needs to be thought about in this world, especially since jockeys are uh, needing to control their weights and keep their weights down, they're probably uh, nutritional deficiencies that, that could have an impact on the response of the brain of spinal cord injury. Uh, we know, for instance, that if we treat uh, animals with high doses of vitamin E uh, chronically in the diet, and it doesn't have to be that high. It can just be a two-fold increase in vitamin E, and if you do that for several months, the response to the injury is significantly attenuated. 
The other approach that might be worth considering that uh, is creatine supplementation. Uh, creatine has been used in the athletic world. It's, it's really not a, uh, a doping type of drug, but it's a nutritional supplement that helps uh, as a pretreatment to protect cellular mitochondria and, and improve neurological recovery. So, so the, the issue of, 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 of jockey diets and the possibility uh, of them having long-term uh, vitamin deficiencies that could increase the risk of damage to the brain or spinal cord, I think, needs to be considered, because that could be fixed fairly readily. And I think that's one of the, that, that web, one of the things we can address. Uh, Jeff, I mean, I saw you commenting there, right? That, that and the inflatable vest. Uh, do you want to respond to some of the things? Well, I'd, I'd like to kind of go over, I, I kind of skirted around your question about the, the pushback from helmets. And I think when, when the first helmet rules came out, there were two states that adopted the ASTM rule. And at that time, there were two helmets that met the ASTM standard. One was the Lexington Safety Products, um, which I think was the initial pushback. That was the major pushback. Well, that helmet at that time was kind of still a work in progress, and it was a, the company went out of business, leaving one, only one company that had a helmet that was ASTM. Um, since the, not everybody's head was the same, and it just, nobody, it just didn't work. It was, it was too early to really do ASTM. When we, we went in, and one of the first things I did in this position with the model rules committee for AFCI was to change the helmet model rule to allow standards from other, na other countries. When we opened it up to the EN 1384, the PAS 015, the Australia and New Zealand standard, basically any, any country that had some type of standard, independent testing standard in place, we opened the helmet rule up. That allowed up 12 to 15 different varieties. Everyone, there was still some pushback, but at least everyone could had an opportunity to shop out, shop for their helmet and find one that actually fit better. During that same time period, uh, the Jockeys Guild, and, and I have to give a special thanks to Scoop Vessels, who's here today, has been trying to help us find um, companies that would get in, take the, the Caliente shell or the, the shell that everybody's comfortable with and create and develop a new helmet that has the properties that would meet the ASTM standard but has the comfort and design that, that fits the, the jockey's riding style. A lot of the helmets when they first came in, especially the, the ASTM helmets, there were plenty of them out there, but they were all designed for other equestrian activities. They had a bill on them, or they, had, they, were too high, they sat too high on your head, or there wasn't enough protection. There was just a lot of, they weren't made specifically for jockeys. What we need to do as an industry is do research and development and take the shell that everybody likes, take a, a design that everybody likes, put the padding in, that meets the ASTM standard. And we're, we're working, unfortunately, we had, um, we were working with a company out of Indianapolis who had designed a prototype that was very, got a very favorable review from the riders, but the industry, the, the product was put on the back burner. We took the prototype to another company in California, did the same thing, they were very interested, but unfortunately, they moved it back. They said, we can get to it in a couple of years. Nobody, I don't, I don't know if the, the horse racing industry doesn't provide enough of a market for companies to get actively involved in it or what the problem is. But if we can get, um, as an industry, go and reach out, like, we, like you said, on the safety rails and get input from maybe somebody knows a company that will get actively involved and create a helmet that everybody is, is designed specifically for the ride, the jockeys and the exercise riders and people on, on the horseback, and we, we'll avoid the pushback going forward. So, uh, Mike, is that an assignment? Do you want to address that? <laughs> I think it's um, incumbent upon the Guild, NTRA, tracks, and get together and find that group that can move forward with it. It's just easier said than done to, to find a manufacturer in such a limited market, I think, as Jeff touched on. Well, and this was sort of where bicycling, bicycle racing was in the 1970s, where you almost have to have the rule in place before you can get the market, create the market, and so it's almost a phased, phased uh, implementation that has to happen because, you know, right now you don't have a big enough market because you don't have the rule and vice versa. So, I, I want to move on to another issue that uh, uh, I know several of you know something about, and that is safety reins. Um, Mike, what's the role of safety reins in the discussion of that in accreditation? 
the short answer is safety reins currently are not a requirement of the Alliance accreditation, which sort of tells you how we work. When and if a model rule is written and it's in place where, which would take the cooperation of all parties involved, HBPA and Jog Skilled probably most likely to sign off on the model rule when that takes place, we can move forward with making it one of the standards that we would adopt. Jeff, Robert, you want to comment on that? Uh, again, I think safety reins, when they were first introduced um, eight, ten years ago, whatever it was, everybody thought, again, it was a no-brainer. And uh, uh, There's been pushback from owners, owners of trainers groups that uh, I, I don't quite understand. Some of the arguments against them don't hold much merit. Um, I think we can continue to work on it and get something. If we all work together, the trainers, the owners, the horsemen, uh, the tracks, to get something that's, that's mutually acceptable, I, I think it would be a wonderful addition to the safety rules in, in the horse racing industry. Um, well, that does speak sort of to, to the one other issue that, that Nick particularly mentioned early on, which was crops, and, 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 and Bob gave us a good introduce, introduction to that. Uh, and I wonder if, uh, uh, Robert, Jeff, you want to discuss sort of the, the role of crops and, and the standards, if, the well, new if, designs? If I may, unfortunately, you know, we we've are trying to mandate cushion crops, but we haven't mandated a standard. And um, as I said earlier, that we worked with a manufacturer in Delaware for several years and found out it was not easy to make a cushion whip, or I should say crop, um, because of the additional weight to the end of the whip made it very difficult. Shafts broke a lot. Um, and what's happening right now, when they don't, I brought samples tomorrow in the work groups, that a lot of the individuals are still using what, just regular graphite shafts that have no flare at the end. What the, when there's no flare, after a few hit, hits against the horse, the shafts penetrate the foam, and especially if they're used in a cheaper foam, which a lot of the whip manufacturers are now around the United States, the shaft goes right through and you're just hitting the shaft directly on, on the horse. So I, I definitely think that we need to, to come up with a, a standard, um, and then at that point, each, each, each manufacturer that's, sell, that's selling them would have to submit several whips to show that they meet it. You, at that point, you put on a permanent labeling on that whip that's easy to see, that you can walk into a room and, and maybe color coordinate them by year. I think they should have a lifespan because this, this foam does decompose. It should be a limited of three to five years. You can walk in, here's a red label from that year, and it's done. I think it's a fairly simple solution. I, I just think that, you know, as I said earlier, that the developing a process for all the safety equipment and getting the information onto a website so that commissions can follow it and make it very, very easy. Uh, just to add. Something I'd like to add, part of this initiative came when there was a call for a ban on whips. And as a compromise, we came up with, with adopting the cushioned riding crop. Part of that initiative was supposed to be a, a public awareness that we, that we had done this. And I don't know, may, maybe Mike can, can tell me different, but I, I think people, the general racing fans, still sees jockeys beating horses with whips. They don't understand that they're, they're softer cushion crops that really don't, don't hurt the horse. Um, perhaps we need to put some type of uh, public statement out or, or continued education to the, bet to the betters or the fans that the, the industry continues to take steps to make racing safer for the horses. To close out the session, maybe I'll let Mike or Nick, either one of you, if you want to address that, uh, because I think that, that, that kind of speaks to a, a, a broader sense. Uh, and Mike had mentioned earlier the performance standards. And I was actually going to talk about Nick's experience with the cushion crop, so I'll speak on behalf of Nick. But one of the characteristics of synthetic services is they're significantly quieter when horses come down the track towards the finish line. So fans sitting at the rail at Keeneland don't hear as many hoop steps as they used to, and all they hear is the sound of cushion crop hitting horses, and it sounds dramatically worse. So the perception is that it's not any better, but I think the nail on the head is really we need to go out there with a 
with a PR campaign and say, here's what we're doing. These are better. They might not sound better, but they're better. And this is the reasons why it's, it's cushioned. It's kinder. And it may be, again, put performance standards on them rather than design standards. <laughs> exactly. Well, I will say that <laughs> there are... There are standards as far as specifications for the crops, but there's no testing standards, whether they're being met. And I think that's what we're significantly missing, is that independent testing standard in all areas I'm talking about. Okay, I want to thank the, uh, thank the panel for their, for their contributions. And